Good afternoon and welcome to Reflections on COVID, COVID-19's Healthcare IT Legacy, a health system CIO Media Inc. production sponsored by SADA. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Health System CIO, and I will be your moderator today. We are looking forward to some audience participation, um, mostly in the Q&A. So send your questions and comments in as they occur to you in the Q&A box, and we will take a look at those and get them to our speakers. And speaking of our speakers, uh, here's our agenda. We're going to go about 35 minutes, 35, 40 minutes with our featured panel discussion. And today we've got Craig Richardville, SVP and CIO of SCL Health, Dr. C.T. Lin, CMIO at UC Health, and Michael Ames, Senior Director of Healthcare and Life Sciences with SADA. So we're going to jump right in because we've got lots of good stuff to talk about today. Um, Craig, let's start with you, my friend. Uh, give us an overview of your organization and your role, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be with you and with the others. We're a uh, $3 billion uh, healthcare system based out of the Denver, Colorado area. Uh, we are the result of two healthcare systems coming together, one being called Sisters of Charity of Leavenworth, which was based out of Kansas and also Exemplo, which was based out of Denver, have come together and we actually have our headquarters here in a little town called Broomfield, just north of Denver. Uh, we operate in uh, several states, uh, Kansas, Colorado, and Montana, with a larger focus in Colorado, where we divide it up into two regions and then the state of Montana. Uh, I am the Chief Information and Digital Officer. We did something that uh, I think is a little bit more progressive uh, in today's world, and we actually combined the, the digital officer and the information officer together. Uh, we created a division called ITDS, so it's Information Technology and Digital Services. So we wanted to make sure we could leverage the, uh, the historical aspect of IT or IS, but also make sure that we we're well positioned for the future as we start to move ourselves and accelerate that work into the digital world. So thank you. Thank you, Craig. Uh, Dr. Lin. Uh, yes, I'm C.T. Lin. I'm the Chief Medical Information Officer for UC Health. Um, our organization is uh, 12 hospitals and about 800 clinics. We have now about 6,000 physicians and about 25,000 staff using our single electronic health record, which happens to be EPIC. Um, we believe we've hit 250,000 online patient accounts, uh, partly because of the pandemic. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and um, I've been in this role for 20 plus years. Uh, I, I first got into informatics as the chief complainer. Uh, 1997, mm -hmm. I sent a seven page unhappy email to our operating staff about all the terrible things that our computer systems did and did not do, and uh, was then invited uh, to be, you know, be part of the problem uh, and be, be on the committee so that I couldn't blame anybody else. And, and that's my inauspicious start. Uh, so uh, happy to be here. Uh, also, I mean, internal medicine practicing physician. So as one of my colleagues says, I have to eat my own dog food. So there it is. Lovely. Very nice. Perfect. All right, Michael. Hey, everybody. Michael Ames, Senior Director for Healthcare and Life Sciences at SADA. Um, great, great uh, honor to be here today with, with Craig and CT and, uh, and appreciate everybody coming and joining. Um, SADA is a Google Cloud consultancy. Um, tightly aligned with Google Cloud Healthcare and Google Cloud's Healthcare and Life Sciences product teams. We service many industries, but healthcare is our biggest and, and most important. Um, overall, I have responsibility to help guide SADA's healthcare and life sciences strategy, and we work really hard to build strong and lasting partnerships with the healthcare industry. Um, my, my KPIs are, are less about revenue, more about what kind of transformational change we're creating among our partners and in the industry. So this has been a fascinating time where we've seen changes that maybe should have been done long ago finally being accelerated. And, and the silver lining here might be some of that transformation that I think a lot of us have been looking for for a long time. So looking forward to this discussion. Excellent, thank you, Michael. 
All right, uh, Dr. Lin, let's start with you. Um, if you want to describe the impact that COVID had at its peak and, and continues to have on your organization and your community. Well, uh, I have to say that uh, I, it, uh, fortunately, we were not part of the first wave in this country or, na or internationally, uh, right? So many of our clinicians had relationships with colleagues in New York, on the West Coast, uh, in Italy and so forth, and we're hearing these reports, and all of us are reading these uh, reports. And so uh, we were able to configure quite a few things. Uh, we went to, uh, uh, our, as we saw our visit volume plummet, uh, fortunately, we were in a position that uh, we had previously set up a telehealth integrated tool uh, with our MyChart, our online portal. Uh, the only challenge was a cultural one that our clinicians thought you know, I don't want to do this telehealth thing. Why do I have to do it? There's so many restrictions. Personally, uh, as an internal medicine physician, I'd say about 80% of my patients are Medicare. And as you may know, before the pandemic, Medicare had high, a great number of restrictions on who could access telehealth. And so frankly, 80% of my patient population were not candidates. That of course mm. changed mid-March. And I have to say, I was talking to, to one of you earlier that uh, I, I connected with my 91-year-old over her smartphone, even though she has no idea what a what an app store is, she says, well, I know how to text with my kids. And so I was able to send her a, a Doximity invite and that, you know, there she is. And she's like, oh, I, I didn't know I could see your face on here. Of course, I, I spoke to her forehead uh, most of the time, but the fact that we could actually communicate with a 90 plus year old patient was pretty transformative. Um, we, so we did see a tremendous drop in our ambulatory volume. We got about half of that back with video visits, uh, fortunately. Um, we configured our uh, hospitals in completely different ways. We went to double occupancy in all of our ICU rooms. Uh, and I can talk later about some, uh, one of my colleagues says, we, we, we are, we're in Apollo 13 mode, trying to duct tape mm. the systems together to be able to, to see the data feeds and so forth. And so it was a pretty, um, Pretty challenging. We're, we're doing daily huddles to come up with daily solutions for the challenges, the multiple challenges each day, each day. but uh, we feel good about coming out the other side and having survived that first wave. Yeah, I like that Apollo 13 mode description. Very apt. Um, Michael, you want to talk about the impact it's had on your organization in terms of servicing customers and things like that? Yeah, yeah. You know, we're a different kind of organization because we're not a hospital, but we have hospitals as our customers and and I think that we had some advantages going into this in that we are a an organization who deals in things like cloud services and and remote work although we have had historically a pretty strong commitment toward a, a brick and mortar presence and being face to face with customers and people actually coming into offices to work we were able to pivot pretty quickly and invoke a, a, an immediate transformation because we had these technologies in place as as CT said for us eating our own dog food means um, uh, uh, working remotely, collaborating online, lots and lots of video meetings. Again, we had those things in place and we were ready to spin them up and, and just use them more aggressively. We uh, uh, immediately saw the, the changes that were happening to our, our customers and partners in the healthcare industry and, and pivoted all of our uh, healthcare and life sciences resources toward helping to um, work to support the kinds of changes that CT and I'm sure Craig are going to talk about and, and engaged even harder in our, in our partnership with Google. I'll have some specific examples and a little bit of some of the things that we built, but it's interesting, it is not only the healthcare industry that, uh, that had to quickly and immediately pivot organizations like ours that are here to support the healthcare industry, obviously, had to do the very same things. And so there was a great sort of sense of unity as we saw our partners having to make dramatic changes and we made dramatic changes ourselves in order to be um, alongside with them. I would say that the other piece that, that, that we did and, and hopefully did well, that I feel was done well, was our executive leadership took a really aggressive role in, in communication, both internal to the company and outside to the world. Um, this, this has been a period of time of, of great openness and sharing of best practices. We, we set up a website dedicated to helping other organizations understand how we were handling um, the work from home situation and all of the, the telecommuting and the remote work and, and pushed that out to the industry in the hopes that other people could benefit um, you know, again, no, no charge, all greater good kind of, of, of work here to help 
other folks benefit from the, some of the changes that we were making that were helping us to continue to operate smoothly. It's been very gratifying um, to, to see other folks adopt some of our practices and we adopted some of theirs and we all kind of survive, push through this thing together. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Everybody had different kind of, there's a strain on, on probably every type of business and every entity. Some were strained because they lost business restaurants. Um, some were strained because of an influx of business. All of a sudden you have customers that need you more and people looking to become your customer. As a vendor, it's an opportunity, a requirement to step up and make sure you can fulfill those things at the level of service you'd been you know, used to providing and to not slip. Um, do you have any thoughts around that, sort of that type of dynamic? Yeah, I think it, it only works if you are in touch with those customers and partners. So one of the, um, one of the things that we identified very early on and messaging that I took back to our engineering teams and sales and support teams is, look folks, until further notice, the healthcare industry is not able to facilitate any discussion that isn't directly related to mm -hmm. their COVID-19 crisis response. Um, and, and so we need to, to pivot all of our services and our support and our operations around that. And by the way, for the most part, what we what we do there is going to be free whenever possible, highly discounted um, whenever not, because we need to work together here to solve a problem for humanity. Um, we 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 uh, they ingested that messaging very quickly and, and did those pivots, but we were only able to do that because I think as an organization, we we talk you know every day with customers and partners and we get a sense of what they're doing and and the vibe i guess we had our finger on that pulse um in an electronic way and and understanding that need allowed us to quickly respond to it whereas we continued to see you know because we, we are customers of other organizations we still had people reaching out to us with sales and service opportunities for things completely unrelated to COVID response and, and we didn't have time for it. And their continued efforts to try to get us to do business as usual, um, I think reflected poorly on some of those organizations who, who clearly had were not reading the tea leaves, were not in touch with us, were not understanding where our priorities were and how they had shifted. So, so that communication and close contact and understanding with our customers' needs, I think was crucial for us to provide them the right kind of support quickly during this time. Craig, um, you want to let's first talk about how COVID impacted your organization, and then um, I'll, I'll ask you to continue or, or follow up on on what I was talking with Michael about. But start off by talking about the impact COVID had. Sure. Yeah, we were not immune uh, from COVID uh, because of our healthcare system and our size, and also the communities that we serve. So a lot of things very similar to. CT's comments and others uh, likely in the audience. But I, I will say there's a couple of things I think that came out of this that uh, really helped us continue to mature. Uh, and, and one is we really started acting as a system. We quickly stood up, you know, being in several different regions to have everybody come together, stand up a system incident command center. You had a lot of your local and your regional centers in place but to coordinate resources, uh, supplies, uh, medications across different states so that we did act as a single system versus people uh, protecting the individual communities that they serve. It was really a really nice thing to see come out of this. And then even at a higher level, uh, we saw it certainly with our senior executives, a lot more community-based services or state-based services. So the CEOs, of the different uh, healthcare systems were collaborating together on how to uh, face this because it is a community or a national crisis. Our chief clinician had uh, daily calls uh, with his peers across the different uh, communities that we serve. And then even in, in my position, uh, several informal conversations of how we were or were not <clears throat> doing things and could share some best practices and also how we were going to come together if asked to start to uh, provide electronic services to some of the statewide um, uh, service centers that were set up with 1,500 to 2,000 
beds, uh, a couple of those of how we're going to provide EMR services and communication services and things like that so that we could be very prepared for it. So I actually saw a lot of the negatives that everybody else did, you know, hit on the finances, hit on the reliability, mm -hmm. hit on the confidence from our consumers. But I think there's several things that help not only health systems like ourselves, but also larger in the communities and the states is a lot more collaboration uh, rather than competitive come into place. So uh, I, I think a lot of good things that we will be uh, better at afterwards from this. In regards to some of the comments, I, I, um, I really enjoyed uh, Michael's comments and he actually is one that uh, for us, you know, kind of stood up. You got to see, we all have hundreds, if not well over a thousand different relationships or contracts with hardware, software, services companies. And when this all started happening, it was very easy, at least for me, to be able to differentiate between those that were really vendors providing a commodity-based service. Hey, I want to still sell you more. Um, I want to sell you this, or we have this new module come into place. And those that were truly partners that were kind of joining forces with you to really help you get through this crisis and for us to help each other get through the crisis. So it was it was a, a, a nice eye opener, I think, for m most of us to be able to differentiate between those pools and you had some that were in the middle. You know, we had concessions that some people offered, uh, whether they were in certain base of services or discounts or delays in payment for cash flow. So those things were all were being offered up. Then you had others who were looking at it as kind of a sales opportunity where they could come in and, and maybe uh, give you something that would be hard for you to get back out of your system. <laughs> right. Think more of the vendor piece. So, yeah. Yeah, that's always an interesting one, right? You know, try it for free, but it takes a lot to put it in and you'll never want to take it out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> CT, did you have thoughts around that? Did, did, you, did you sense a difference between those who were trying to help and those that were trying to sell to me i guess it, it can be obvious but there might be subtleties there there's gray in the middle uh, how do how do you see the whole situation um i have to say that uh that we were fortunate in that uh, many of the requirements we had for our uh, vendor partners uh, um, uh we have a, an innovation center that uh, we've been we stood up uh, three or four years ago and had a number of infrastructure pieces in place, uh, not the least of which was our uh, relationship with Video, V-I-D-Y-O, the company for uh, mm -hmm. integrating uh, um, uh, video into our patient portal. Uh, our challenge was internal cultural uh, uh, divide, right? So patients are ready to go with video visits. Uh, the feds are not necessarily. And uh, I remember actually sitting in a committee meeting about three months prior to the pandemic going, how are we gonna get docs interested in video? Uh, we've been out there beating the bushes and talking to docs and they're sitting there going, yeah, yeah, fine. You can, you can go now. Uh, and, and I imagine the beginning of March, suddenly everyone's going, who was that guy who was here last year talking about video? We ought to talk to that guy. Does anybody have that number? And, and actually we were quite gratified that we went from, I think our number, just like many other places, we went from about 20 video visits per day to 4,000 a day in the space of about two weeks right? Because everyone's business is completely shut down. There's no access to patients. Uh, the phone calls are, you know, the phones are ringing off the hook and, and we were able to stand that up. So in terms of our relationship with our existing vendors, that was, those were tremendous partnerships. It was just our internal culture uh, needed a kick in the, in the pants to, to get going. It was our big challenge. All right. Very good. Um, Craig, what were some of the things you mentioned, some of them, but any other things that you, you can think of that IT did to sort of step up and help uh, the clinicians get through this. Oh yeah, there were uh, there, there's so much. It was really nice again to see the the system uh, come together as a system. So the instant command was certainly one that we put together four of our conference centers together into one large room. Uh, we added analytics into that, so we really were really driving a lot of our decision making and our direction based upon data. We did find out, you know, given some of the uh, the nuances of developing into a system. We had different processes and things happening in different regions or in different hospitals within regions that some of the data was not as clean or reliable as what we would want it to be. So we started doing a lot more standardization, 
to our processes so that the data that was coming in uh, would be distinct and to be able to be used for some of that decision. Like many others, you know, we drove people home basically overnight, uh, those that were not essential to be at a care site or at our headquarters. You know, we usually had about 900 to 1,000 um, that were remote anyway, and we jumped to close to 3,000 uh, within a matter of days and be able to have the the horsepower to to run that, uh, and part of that was um, somebody with SADA and our relationship with Google to help us uh, get through all that connectivity and all of the uh, virtual aspects uh, of the solutions. I will say, you know, when you look at the volumes that uh, were mentioned before, and we were very similar like many others, you didn't really have a hardened virtual environment, and so when you started to really turn those from the hundreds into the thousands, uh, we saw a, a lack of service, a lack of success, some people defaulting to more generic products versus the one that was stood up, that was integrated into our Epic MyChart environment, and then also some, you know, that ended up having to go just to audio because they couldn't get the connection either on our side or on the, on the patient side. And now we're upwards toward 90% plus success rate. So we've been able to harden that solution so that as we continue to utilize that, we have a, a higher success rate. Again, that will attract more providers and patients to it if you have less hiccups to it. Probably the last thing I'll mention is uh, some of the things we did on the digital side. So stood up the chatbots for a, uh, uh, a COVID checker for the public, also did the same thing for those for internal associates. So we felt comfortable for them coming into care environments or into work environments. Uh, they would do daily check-ins uh, via the bots that we uh, produced. Uh, did an auto temp checker, so it comes by, does the facial recognition, uh, checks your temperature to be able to come into uh, the physical plant. So it's, there's several other things that we did more around that. Now, I think we're all in the process, and that's really going across even other industries, of so just people getting out it's just building the confidence of getting people back into a routine of, um, of coming in to uh, either see their provider, virtual or physical, but also being able to get people back into their daily lives. And so I think we have a lot of confidence to be able to get back to our community so that it can start back into, into some of the routines that are very common and that we want to proceed forward with. Very good. Thank you, Craig. Um... Dr. Lynn, any more thoughts on uh, some of the things IT did at your organization? Yeah, we were, uh, you know, I, I, uh, my favorite quote, and, and Michael, this is a, a kind of a Google saying, right? So there are more, there are more smart people who don't work for you than who do work for you, right? And so, so how how silly of us to go, oh, we're gonna we're gonna only use the intellectual property that that, that our the horsepower and the brains within our organization, uh, the, the, these relationships with our external vendors allow us to sort of leapfrog things that we came up with ourselves. And, and so, you know, I have uh, three real brief uh, examples of, of innovation partners. Uh, we work with uh, Agile MD for clinical pathways uh, and at our Epic Electronic Health Record, although we're moving in the direction of pathway development, um, our existing multi-year relationship with Agile allowed us to on the fly change recommended pathways for our clinicians and uh, and so as COVID uh, evolved day after day and in fact our command center would make decisions um, hourly right uh, we're going to test this population of patients and these are not qualified to test because our our testing is so limited oh wait no we changed it at noon and so th this population is you know immune compromise is now a, a population will test or yes we will test ambulatory no we won't test these folks and so how do you keep up with what's the current recommendation out of command center for who's testing and uh, what kind of treatments we recommend and who who gets to transfer to the ICU? We were able to incorporate that into a pathway, and we had a number of physician builders who were both uh, qualified to make changes in the EHR as well as the author tool within the Agile pathway. And within minutes of command center decisions, you would see that reflected in the pathway. And across our 12 hospitals, as you might imagine, a telephone tree of calling people down and saying, hey, today, uh, this is what we do with testing. Oh, today, this is what we do with the antivirals. Uh, no, you, you go to the pathway and you know that hourly that thing is up to date. And as a result, we could actually see that a couple of hospitals that were not performing as well in early March on, on, on these COVID patients 
by the beginning of uh, by the end of March, after the pathways went into place, you could see the performance and the mortality uh, risk improve in in the hospitals that were all using the pathway up to the same standard as our academic center. So that was quite quite. Uh, uh, um, uh, gratifying to see the Apollo 13 thing I was I was mentioning earlier. That's not an innovation partnership. That's our Microsoft Teams tool that uh, you know we we had just gotten used to using Teams for our internal conversations and um, had started to transition to doing video conferences internally in IT and elsewhere with Microsoft Teams. We actually had nurses take tablets used for other purposes, and the challenge was that. Since we did double occupancy in these ICU rooms that are designed for single occupancy, as you might imagine, there's only one jack for the, the ventilator and for the vital signs monitor. And so you put a second ventilator and a second vital signs monitor in that room, how are you going to get the alarms at the central nurses station? You can't. So in the beginning, we were stationing a nurse or a person at the door of the room to go, do you hear an alarm? Because then you can run in and see what it is and then come back and report it to us. What an incredible inefficient use of our time. We actually ended up having people set up a day long, 12 hour long Microsoft Teams set up, one tablet on a stick facing the second monitor and the second tablet at the nurse's station right next to the usual monitors. And now you've got a Teams video audio visual and you can monitor up to four second bed B, second beds in rooms and put them at the nurses station. So even without the hardware network jacks, we were using tablets and Microsoft Teams to Apollo 13 duct tape our way into central monitoring. Whatever gets the job done, right? Very right. good, very creative. Uh, Michael, let's start with you on this. Um, do you think IT has been forever elevated to the status of a true business partner because of the COVID-19 crisis. That's what I've been hearing. What are your thoughts? Oh, you know, I, I would love to believe it. There's a skeptical part <laughs> of me because this isn't the first crisis. And, um, uh, and, and I think with every sea change in technology or every compelling new need, we ask this question, we're like, is, is IT really a first class citizen now? Um, and I and I think that I think that this has definitely moved that ball forward. There there are organizations, and again, you know, part of the reason why why UC Health and, and SCL Health are here, there are organizations where, from from my exposure and experience, I would say they are already there, and, and this has certainly helped to validate the cultural expectation among executive leadership in those two hospital systems that IT is a key player. Um, in, in essentially all uh, hospital system strategic decisions. And so, so, so some, some organizations were already there and were being validated. Others, yeah, I think if they responded effectively to this, it, it has moved it forward. And I would say that one of those reasons is that data has been essential to managing this crisis. I don't think we've ever had a, a national crisis that has been captured so much in charts and graphs than, than what we're seeing right now whether we're charting COVID diagnosis rates or things that are happening in the stock market, um, everybody has, has lines, lines in front of them that they maybe didn't before. And underneath all of that data are systems that are managing and processing that. Um, in, in, in essence, IT has become the data infrastructure department for COVID-19 response at every hospital system and, and, and nationwide. And so I think I think what we're getting is a greater sense of how important it is to have current, accurate data in front of you in order to make strategic decisions. And, and folks who or organizations who have who have stepped up to that challenge well, I think are definitely earning um, a seat at the table that will last beyond the COVID-19 crisis. At least I hope that is true. I want to I want to squash my skepticism and say that's the way it should be and I hope we'll see it play out that way. CT, uh were you there? Were you already there and uh, what about for maybe some uh IT departments and health systems that were not there? Do you think this has changed things? Well, um I I can't speak to to organizations out, outside of uh, ourselves. I, I can say that in the 20 years I've been in this business, I've seen a gradual change and it was a very accelerated uptick just in the past uh, couple of months. 
Um, I have a team of about uh, 24 physician informaticists on my team, and uh, we have about 12 uh, clinical nurse informaticists as well. Actually, that's not true. I think the number is 17. I was corrected the other day. So uh, we, we actually stood up a meeting called the Daily Jig. Uh, we have a group meeting called uh, the Joint Informatics Group. And uh, we, were, we were used to meet um, monthly, and we made that a daily meeting because things were coming out of command center so quickly. And uh, it was gratifying to have our daily jig and be able to respond to uh, requirements from command center and actually use our existing relationships to talk to all of the silos within the organization to bring everyone together. Just like Craig was talking about, we felt a lot more like a system than we ever had. Right? We're, we're talking to each other about what's the daily stats on COVID? Are we going up? Are we going down? What's the ICU demand? You know, what's going on with, uh, with elective uh, surgeries? And can we turn that back on? What's, what's that? And so being able to nimbly do all of that was, was really uh, uh, gratifying. And, and um, as a result of these conversations and the effectiveness of these relationships, uh, actually during the uh, pandemic, um, we've had two or three of our informaticists be elevated to CMO level conversations. And they've been permanently invited now to the infrastructure at a higher level just because, hey, we keep calling you, why don't you just become a standing member of our committee? And that's been really kind of cool to see that, 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 that the leadership and the, the relationships we cultivated over the years were so valuable during this crisis that folks ended up saying, well, you should be part of our group. Well, what are you doing? What were we calling you as ad hoc? You should be a standing member. So that's been really kind of cool to see. Craig, it, you know, following on that, we went from a dynamic which was mentioned earlier in the call of, hey, check out telehealth. Hey, what do you think about using telehealth to doctors banging down your door saying, please give me telehealth. So that changes the whole dynamic. Does it go back to the way it was or do they have more respect now for what IT can can help them do? Yeah, I think that's a, a very interesting question. We're all going to have probably see the same picture and, and have different viewpoints just coming from different lenses. And, and the way that I see it is I think part of what uh, we do to be successful, or at least for myself, is that, you know, over one's career, you learn very quickly that uh, IT is not something that you stand up and you set up and people come to you. IT for me and digital services now as well, is we go out into the environment. We go out into the clinical environment, the business environment. Part of, I think, for us to take advantage of the tools and the data is we have to understand and be able to provide that uh, to those that are actually in the field or making those types of decisions. So kind of the open door thing, it's not that we have the knowledge or the tool set. Our goal is to give that to you to educate the leaders, to educate uh, those on the front line of these are the potential capabilities of that being done, and then they'll take advantage of it and use it. So, so I, I see it um, a little bit different in that I, I don't know if I would say it's been elevated. It needs to be actually, I think, penetrated throughout the organization, mm. and it needs to become part of everybody's process of how they plan on delivering care, and then you can look to see uh, how you go across other industries. And I'm a big fan of imitating or stealing from others of the experiences that you have, for example, with Amazon or anybody else that's a large tech company or the retail that's now becoming more tech-based is those experiences, you know, we should expect those as consumers and uh, of healthcare services and, and be able to have a similar same experience with 724, top of the line, great service, I'm getting what I need, I can elevate what I need to elevate, I'm being constantly engaged and contacted. And that's, I think, is for us to be able to move that out into uh, the parts of the organization that are actually delivering the services or providing some of the business needs. Very good, very good. All right, um, let's start, Craig, let's stick with you on this. Do you think some of the changes brought about by COVID-19 will not go away? We talked about sort of a behavioral status of IT, but if you want to get more specific, um, and maybe it's just a question of uh, the, the sort of the acuity of the offering. So if you had to stand up or increase the capacity of a telehealth offering or any other offering, does that now need to be right-sized or, or rationalized for a much lower volume? 
Are there dynamics and things you're thinking about along those lines? Yeah, I, I think this is, uh, you know, I sit on a, an advocacy committee for CHIME and we're going through a lot of the different bills that are out there and how we want to influence health and human services and other things coming out of D.C. And why should anything have to go away? You know, there was a lot of relaxing that was done where those were state boundaries or what tools you could use. Uh, nothing dramatic or traumatic in a negative way came out of relaxing a lot of those. And I think from my perspective, you know, we put a lot of boundaries uh, in our services and at that time, probably for the right reason. But I think as you see us maturing outside of just being a healthcare service, but being more of a digital and a technology company that provides healthcare, the way that we've done some of that, I think has limited us from the past. So when uh, previously CT was talking about, you know, 40 to 50 visits a day going into the tens of thousands, um, we were always ready for that. We just never had the opportunity or the incentive to move in that direction. And I think that's really just one component of many, whether you talk about virtual hospitals, monitoring people at home, really kind of focus us more in that population health community service perspective versus being volume based. I think all of these things that came out of COVID, uh, they need to be looked at, but I would hope nine out of 10 of those stay. And it forces us to be able to even think what else is possible for us that we can mature or learn from another organization or another industry to help us continue to advance the access to healthcare and the successful provisioning of healthcare you know, across our communities. So I hope it stays. Very good, Michael. Yeah, um, plus one to, to everything that Craig said. Yeah, our, our focus at SADA has a lot to do with collaboration and uh, we have seen some amazing instances of collaboration. Healthcare systems that we know <coughs> are bitter enemies um, in the press and they're competing all the time and uh, have, have come together in order to help to solve certain problems. I'll give a, a, a brief plug here for the National Response Portal, which is a SADA project done in, in partnership with Google to help provide um, a couple of things, a, a private sector uh, an analog to some of the work that the CDC does with infectious disease surveillance by bringing together data from a number of hospital systems, integrating that into a single portal, lots of charts and graphs, public data, uh, forecasting models, and a variety of things to help tackle the COVID problem, which could not be done without a number of hospital systems, and we hope many, many more over time, coming together in a sense of greater good to do a humanitarian project to help solve a crisis. But we positioned this thing specifically to have a life after COVID-19. Uh, whether it's just supporting annual infectious disease uh, surveillance with the flu cycle or other things or helping to manage healthcare response to natural disasters. Um, we, we've, we've built this to last. And, and what we hope is that at least so far as we can look at the needs of public health and our response to crises that are really badly affecting the lives of individuals and families, that we can see this kind of open collaboration continue between healthcare systems, between government and private industry, between industry and, and academia. Um, if we look back a year from now, I expect that we will have lost some of the urgency but if that same spirit of saying, look, here's an area where we can all work together for a greater good, if that has continued at even 80% the level that it's at now, um, I, I think that will be a, a tremendous positive outcome from this. Very good. Um, Dr. Lynn? Yeah, I have two uh, brief comments about this. One is that to the point of uh, health systems who you normally compete uh, actually collaborating uh, are critical care pulmonary specialists actually set up on our Microsoft Teams site, uh, an invitation to all of the pulmonary critical care docs that uh, they knew throughout Metro Denver and actually throughout the state, ended up getting about 300 critical care docs to collaborate on a single Teams site. And uh, because each one of these folks were getting feeds from around the country and, and having one-on-one -on -one conversations about hey, what do you know about proning before ventilators? And what do you know about antiviral use and so forth? Actually, we're able to have a cross health system 
uh, collaboration uh, across multiple cities uh, to say, well, what I'm hearing is, and what I'm seeing in my ICU is this, and then having that practice spread uh, throughout the region was really cool to see that. They actually set up 20 sub-channels, organized their own leadership so that each conversation was organized in a way that wasn't uh, individual one-on-one -on -one emails. There's an aggregate place to have that conversation, sort of a Facebook-like conversation for best practice in the ICU. How cool is that? Um, and that was incredibly successful. So really gratified that we have that, um, those relationships that sort of sur superseded uh, health system boundaries. And then uh, secondly, on top of that, um, uh, we um, are seeing that uh, practically speaking, in terms of our outpatient telehealth visits, uh, we saw about an 80% shift over to virtual in the, in the first months. But you know, now that we're opening up clinics again, we're seeing patients prefer in-person visits. Turns out there's something to the physician-patient relationship that has to do with being in person. Imagine that. And, and I'm, same for me, and, you know, I, it's gratifying to be able to get my 91 year old on that little tiny screen that's, you know, two inches wide. And, you know, is, it, is that, okay, hey, is this, is this a problem on, on my elbow? And you know, mm -hmm. I have no idea what that is. Uh, I, I, so, I'd be interested you know, to know, I'd be interested to know if you see an age breakdown in terms of uh, uh, the people that are going back to the in-person. Is it generally older folks that want to get back in front of the doctor? Because I don't want to get in front of the doctor if I don't have to. I I do telehealth every day of the week. You know, I think it's a little early to know, but it's surprisingly not age based. I have some of my uh, older patients who are very happy with remote. You know, I don't want to be out there. My my kids want me to stay in the house, and it's great that I can see you virtually. On the other hand, uh, I had a 45 year old guy I hadn't seen for an annual visit in three years. Chooses now to come in for yeah. an in-person annual routine visit. I said, who knows? <laughs> he wanted to get out of his house. He wanted to get out of his house. <laughs> Tired of being uh, isolated with all the restrictions, possibly. Um, all right, let's let's uh, let's get in our uh, one of my favorite features, uh, which is ask a co-panelist. Um, I am going to ask Michael to go first. So Michael, do you have a question for either or both of your co-panelists? Yeah, yeah. So for both of them, and I'll admit to a little, a little bit of a personal, um, a little bit of a personal agenda here. I spend a lot of time talking with family and friends and folks on social media about this crisis and and what it means. And one of the things that is challenging is that the answers are in the data, but the data is nuanced, and interpreting it is a is a nuanced activity, and it it takes a lot of work and is often fruitless trying to help people to understand how you know these inputs into some public health function result in this output in terms of of health outcomes and uh, and I'm, I'm I'm just really curious if either of you have thoughts on what we can do um, from our positions in in IT thought leadership to help uh, to help the general public develop a better understanding of the data toward the goal of, of their making good and responsible decisions for their own health and for public health. Let me, I don't, do one of you want to go first? Well, it's Craig, let's, uh, why don't you jump in first? Sure. Um, well, I think that's a, that's a very interesting question because um, in a lot of cases, yes, the answer certainly is in the data. I think for me, We've got to make sure that the data is correct and that it's clean and that it's reliable in order to find the right answers. But I am a big fan, as, as you kind of move yourself in it, it uh, toward the, the end of your question is, I am a big fan of self-service. I do think um, you know, one of the most underutilized resources in any industry, including healthcare, is the patient themselves. So I do think we do have an obligation to start creating more opportunities, whether they're uh, apps or other things that allow patients easy access to understand in a reliable way things that are happening uh, in their life via health or the social determinants that surround health so that we can help them help manage themselves better versus waiting to the opportunity where they feel that they are sick or ill and have to enter into a healthcare facility. So I'm a big fan of of the health and wellness piece of pushing things out to as close as you can to the patient or the consumer, uh, potentially in this case, and moving that stuff out. And that's the only way we're going to do it is, is actually with data. 
and make sure that it is reliable, it's dependable, it's easy to be accessed, and it gives the, uh, and that's where it's part of the, the reasoning of some of the bots that we developed, and you know, those all learn. So they are in the process of learning as they make mistakes as a machine, which are obviously manufactured by humans. Uh, they are prone to making mistakes. And so as it learns from that mistakes, the probability of success gets higher and higher. But at some point, we've got to give those tools back out to the patients and not burden the providers with administering the tool, but put them right into the patient's hands. Dr. Lynn? So for me, um, I take your question very personally um, because uh, just like vaccines, just like climate change, scientists have unfortunately all too often been been satisfied with saying well here's the data you should understand that and we're terrible as communicators it, it, as a whole I, I i take that very personally as a as a critique as a scientist as well as a physician that uh, we're, we're we as a profession are terrible at translating data into meaning for our clients for our customers for our partners and, and this is the same thing COVID 19 is is challenging, it moves fast, it's highly uncertain. And as a scientist, you get that. But to communicate your uncertainty to your, your public, to the public, is quite difficult. Now, I'll put in a, a, a shameless plug for my blog, uh, ctlin.blog, yeah. where I weekly talk about issues that I'm struggling with, right? And if you look back uh, just in the last couple of weeks, I, I wrote a blog on sensitivity, sensitivity and specificity, and positive predictive value and negative predictive value for antibody testing. It's ridiculously hard to understand that. And notwithstanding that I'm the son of a statistician who probably cringed as he read my blog, I did my <laughs> best to try to translate those numbers into something meaningful. Because even with a test that has a specificity of 97%, if your population prevalence of disease is 3%, you know, 97% sounds great, but it turns out that test is gonna be wrong most of the time if you have a positive test, right? And people don't understand that. And I try to explain that in the blog and it took me, you know, five pages of rewriting and trying to make it understandable. It's really hard stuff. So we end up having to do extra work to take our findings, which we all get as scientists and make that publicly understand. So that's my, that's the struggle I have. Yeah, thanks guys. Good answers, tough question, appreciate it. All right, I'm gonna take a, an audience question here. Um, how is each organization dealing with the backlog of projects that were delayed due to COVID-19? What strategies are in place to triage projects to ensure a balance between COVID, standing back up normal operations, and fulfilling promises made before COVID? Craig, you want to jump on that one? Yeah. Um, so what we developed here uh, a little bit more than a year ago, at least with all the stuff that's related to information technology services and digital services, is really I have I have 10 um, programs that we developed and all of our work runs through the programs. Um, all the projects that feed within those programs have very uh, measurable deliverables. They've all been prioritized by the senior team. So for us to, and going back through, uh, we had to represent all of our work, all of the leadership team of all the different activities that were going on so that we can get confirmation that we're working on the right stuff and moving forward with that. If I had to guess, because there's, you know, as you know, hundreds of projects all within 10 programs, I would say 95% plus were to move forward and to proceed because they all had benefits that in some cases, especially if you look at some of the digital work and some of our optimization work, we almost need to accelerate that work because we need those benefits quicker now. And, and not be able to wait uh, for those to be achieved. So the large majority of those, and the only places where we saw some delays really had to do with um, things that either had conflicting resources or we tried to accelerate some work, or there was a financial burden that it would lay on the organization for a period of time. So we would ask for either some forgiveness or some concessions or move that forward. So you know, for us, we just kind of revisited and make sure that we tied back into our strategic plan We'll go through our normal process of uh, continuing to mature that. So we didn't really have a lot that I would say uh, we progressed forward. I had did a little tidbit thing that I started for the senior team of all the successes that we made 
even though COVID was going on, we still moved forward and had a lot of great successes coming in. So it's, it's definitely a balance, but I think it's one that the organization, if you truly believe that you're moving into a digital technology competitive space with large retail and large tech companies, you've got to continue with those investments and have those returns come back. Very good, Dr. Lynn. Um, I'm just going to briefly say, uh, check back with me in a year because uh, everything is up in the air. We've got uh, budget reductions. We've got priorities that have completely shifted because of the pandemic. But yes, we are looking back at the existing backlog. And some of the things are no longer relevant uh, because of the pandemic. Right. And some of them are twice as important. And, uh, and so, uh, yes, uh, all of that. And we have to be nimble about reassembling our, our existing uh, backlog. Yep, everything is going to be reevaluated. Very interesting. All right, listen, don't run away yet, everyone. Uh, we're almost finished, but we have a very special event, a special segment today from Dr. Lin, who is going to play the ukulele for us. And uh, if you want to describe more about the 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 song we're going to hear, uh, the title or anything like that, set it up, a, tee it up a little better, and then have at it, Dr. Lin. We're we're honored. So this is a song who was that was uh, uh, part of the Academy Award-winning um, um, uh, movie uh, Toy Story 3, uh, which is You've Got a Friend in Me. And uh, uh, it actually fits well on the ukulele, and, and for several reasons. One is that uh, IT relationships and, uh, and being good partners, I think, is crucial to the success of IT um, and, and to any large organization, frankly. And also part of the national conversation, I thought this was relevant given uh, recent events um, in, um, uh, on the East Coast um, and uh, recent police events that uh, were so divided that uh, sometimes it's helpful to have a song to, that thinks about uh, reconnecting and, and being good partners and being good, uh, good friends. So here we go. <laughs> a friend in me you've got a friend in me when the road looks rough ahead when you're miles and miles from your nice warm bed just remember what your old pal said for you've got a friend in me you've got a friend in me you got a friend in me got troubles then I've got them too there isn't anything I wouldn't do for you if we stick together we can see it through cuz we got a friend in me yeah we got a friend in me. some of the folks might be a little bit smarter than I am bigger and stronger too maybe but none of them would ever love you the way that I do. It's me and you, boy. And as the years go by, our friendship will never die. You're going to see it's our destiny, because you've got a friend in me. Yeah. You've got a friend in me. Oh, that was beautiful. That was really, really nice. Awesome. Thank you so much. So um, regarding continuing education, for those of you who need proof of attendance, you can use the final slide in this deck. You'll receive an email when the on-demand recording of today's event is ready. If you want to sponsor an event with us or book a custom event, you can reach out to Nancy Wilcox from our team, and you can go to our website to re uh, register for one of our upcoming webinars. With that, I want to thank our talented panel, Craig, can you said you can play the kazoo, Craig? Is that true? <laughs> I didn't that true? work, so you know, I was gonna go for the sing along, but I didn't see the words. <laughs> All right, next time, next time we'll have to get the words right. ahead of time. Craig Richardville, Dr. C. T. Lynn, and Michael Ames, and I very much want to thank Sada for sponsoring this event and making it possible. And I want to thank you for attending. And with that, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.